Good afternoon. This is your host, John, host of the Research Review, creating a platform to connect and inspire. I'm here with another excellent guest today, Martin, who I've been meaning to get on this show for the longest time because his research projects have probably interested me one of the most. So, yeah, thank you for coming on the show today. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your research? Uh, Thank you. Thank you for having me, John. I, I know it's not visible, but I'm really excited to get this started. Uh, yes, so uh, during last year, the SURE program 2022, I actually did two research. One was mostly focused for the SURE. The other one was for a different conference. The research I did for the SURE program was seeing how different pH levels of cancer cells, specifically ovarian cancer, can impact its uh, its hallmark of cancer. Basically, this like foundations that a cancer works with to both its reproduction and its migration to other parts of its body. Mm-hmm. The other research I did was for a conference that was going to be held the following fall, uh, which I still did both simultaneously. Uh, it was more on the cordyceps militaries and, and its growth and development inside tobacco hornworms, which we presented at the Entomological Society of America. It was held in Vancouver, Canada. I'm doing this year around another project for honeybees uh, and how multiple factors like nosema and tracheomites impact the colony collapse uh, disorder, which is um, a different way of saying like how why are bees dying around the world? Mm-hmm. And we're presenting that for both the sure 2023 and for the ESA that's going to be held this time around in Maryland. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Now, I really want to uh, ask you about the cancer about the the cancer research that you were working on. But really quick, for those who don't know what cordyceps are, just give us a quick rundown because they are the most fascinating thing. Yeah, uh, especially now through um, recent media shows and things like that. The Last uh, of Us. Yep, yeah. yep. Uh, cordyceps is a type of fungus that specifically targets colonies or social insects. Um, these are most uh, relevant, specifically in tropical areas like fire ants that you witness in the Amazon uh, rainforest or even bees and any kind of social insects like that. So then um, most of the time they get uh, targeted by an insect. Uh, they start uh, consuming it a little bit in from the inside. Uh, most people would think they target sort of like the brain system of the insect, which is actually incorrect. It actually targets the muscles and the nerves that respond to the muscle system. That way they sort of hijack without the body fully uh, um making sense of them. Then after a certain uh, time frame, they start actually developing from the outside. That's when they start uh, both taking controls of the insect's muscles. And at, at a certain point, uh, it starts uh, reaching its sort of its peak uh, season where the, ant will, the um, hijacked ant will post into a higher point the fruiting body, which is the part of the mushroom that you would see, like the actual, the yeah. what you call the mushroom, not the fungus, would develop. You see it, and then that's where the spores would develop, and then the cycle would continue uh, to repeat. That's so cool. It's like really fascinating. It's creepy and it's weird, oh, but yeah. it's and especially if you if you look at a video of these things growing out of the ant or out of. I thought they were just an ant at the beginning because that's what when I looked into it, that's what I saw them reference to. But um, you said that you did them. Uh, what was the insect that you did? Uh, it's a uh, tobacco hornworm. It's sort of like the uh, pupal stage of uh, lar- uh, larvae mm-hmm. and things like that from moth. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's that's fascinating. Now, why do they go up to a higher point exactly? Uh, just because um, since I mentioned that mostly this cordyceps resides in tropical areas and things like that, you know, with a lot of for- uh, foliage and tree lines, grass lines, mm-hmm. things like that, there's a lot, not a lot of windage that passes through like a like dense forest so the point of that is that the cordyceps uh, goes to a high peak so that way it sort of like trickles down or rains upon like on ground insects yeah. that are reside right below the the hijacked host okay so that's the the ideal place for the um for the cordyceps to sprout yes but it it's it just it just really interests me like how does it or how does it know to do that uh, it, so it basically does it through uh, uh, various fa- ways of chemical responses and uh-huh. mechanisms. Yeah, it's uh, cordyceps 
the way they hijack over ants is through certain chemicals that they release yeah. through the mycelium, which is sort of like a, a way of like its roots, similar to trees. Right. Um, trees take up nutrients and things like that through chemical exchanges. Mm -hmm. The fungus does it the same through uh, the ant's muscle system. At a one point, it, it, the fungus develops enough where it can start pr uh, sort of consuming the muscles uh of the insects and oh. especially once it reaches its higher point it sort of actually takes up all of it which is how a lot of the insects start binding down on on either a leaf or a, a grass or something like that so anything that's a higher point it, it actually jaws down on it and yeah. that's how they hang on this uh, it's so wild it's perfectly designed for that too because mycelium it's so microscopic I don't know. Would you consider it microscopic? It's very yes. small. Yeah, it's microscopic compared to the the root system of a tree. Now, in in light of the recent uh, The Last of Us, do you think there's a possibility that it could develop to humans? No, there is in in science and biology specifically. There's always a possibility for anything. Right. Now, what is the uh, chances of that pro uh, probability to happen? Uh, I would assume it's very low. Right. Just because in biology for that fungus to thrive in a human body, it requires to go through a lot of mutation, basically ev evolu uh, ev evolution, and it to be accustomed to both our temperature, mm -hmm. our complex body, when you take into account how an insect works versus a human, and then how, like, all of our defense system that we have, because while Sure, we are somewhat uh, delicate and vulnerable organisms as humans. Yeah. We still have some pretty complex systems that enable us to at least defend our own bodies. And Very then, complex, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then even just through medication, because uh -huh. uh, that would also prevent development of fungus. Because even while it's not cordyceps specifically, we do sometimes get infected by other type of fungus, and we already have medication for those. So it will take drastic changes and several of them for that fungus, for that cordyceps to be finally hijacking our body. Yeah. But do you think, I know you said it would be like a long-term process with evolution, and we... Like you said medicine to defend against fungal infections, but do you think something? Do you think cordyceps could be kind of engineered to use as a weapon in say like biological warfare? Oh uh, yes, yes for sure. Uh, that, and there's proof of that uh, in history where um, there was an outbreak of anthrax. Uh -huh. Anthrax yeah. was medically uh, was engineered as a bioweapon, and uh, it originated from a fungus. Uh, and I don't know if, uh, if you've known like the history with the U.S. is that it, w it was sent through the mail uh, U.S. mailing uh, system, uh -huh. at least parts in uh, south e uh, southeast U.S. like Florida and things like that. Yeah. And it started making its way up north. Uh, obviously, um, luckily the um, Secret Service and stuff like that took notice on that. Right. But that's literally a fungus that. Uh, people deconstruct, weaponize some aspects of it as deadly forms, mm -hmm. and then obviously were able to convert it into like an air assault kind of system. So how would how how did anthrax attack the human body? Uh, if people are interested, I would recommend watching them called uh, a show called The Hot Zone. The Hot Zone. Uh, yes, it's bo mostly about all microbiology and uh, the USAMRIT is the United States Armed Forces Medical Disease Center. Uh, it's sort of like the CDC, but they tar um they are more sort of more aggressive towards the treatments and their immediate response with it. But it ex the show explains both the Ebola outbreak that also happened in the same area, and then the anthrax, uh, and it explains a lot of the biologicals of the aspects of those two attacks. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really fascinating. Yeah, shout out to the Hot Zone. We're gonna check that out. I'm gonna check that out later tonight for sure, because yeah, awesome. <laughs> that's something I'm really interested in. Um, now, before I move on to the the pH with the cancer cells. Um, this the mycelium is, is is very fascinating. What are you going to be doing in the future to continue with this project? Do you, so do you think? we made a little shift from the cordyceps to nosema. That mm -hmm. is the research that going to that's actually happening right now. We applied for the share program twenty twenty three. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, that okay. one's going to entail uh, honeybees specifically, the ones that produce the honey for us, mm -hmm. and their relations to colony collapse disorder. That is uh, another way of say of scientifically saying how, why are bees dying around the world. Right. Um, so the shift we made is from cordyceps into nosema, and alongside with the nosema, 
uh, we're going to be looking at tracheomites as well. So then the, the nosema mostly targets the bees' guts where they sort of create the byproduct for wax, bees, and other things. Mm -hmm. And then tracheomites impact the respiratory system of bees, which uh, it's really important for the bees because the bees have us, uh, insects just in general have us more simple but more efficient respiratory system. But that respiratory system enables uh, and supports the meta metabolic production of their guts. Yeah. Interesting. So Mose no Nosema pretty much functions similar to cordyceps. Uh, no, no, no. It no? targets a little bit different. Now there are morphological structures okay. like the mycelium and things like that. Yeah. But it impacts the lining of the bees' guts, and that way it impacts the products of bees and wax that they uh, are able to regurgitate because regurgitate, uh -huh. um, that's how bees make honey. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, it uh, it doesn't really create an actual fruit like the cordyceps or like other store-bought uh, fungus and mushrooms. Okay, okay, that makes more sense. So I had a little hard time grasping that concept because originally I thought, and I know you said this was a big misconception, I thought that it went in to hijack the brain. Not the nosema. The okay. nosema just um, uh, doesn't even hijack. It sort of damages the bee's uh, gut lining. That's yeah. what it does. Uh, cordyceps, they does it, the cordyceps doesn't even uh, target the insect's brain, but it targets the, its nervous system and specifically the nerves that allow the movement of the insects. Uh -huh. Now, there are other um, fungus that, yeah, they can target the brain and they've been shown research that, or this research that helps recreate neurons and links like that but i haven't gone into full details or right. like research into those but it's uh but yeah there's like just like any of the organisms on the world there's different uh purpose for them same goes with the fungus mm -hmm. interesting yeah no i'm i'm definitely hyped to see um everything you do with this in the future and we'll ha definitely have to get you back on the show when you you know dive more into this and during 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 the summer as well because i'll be i'll be in, in town i won't be doing the shirt program uh this summer but i'll be in town so awesome I'll still right. have the studio up and running, and you got to come on like periodically and do some updates on that project because oh, yeah. it's something I could talk for or something I can learn about forever. <laughs> yeah, I'll be happy to share that with uh, with you. Awesome. Anything else you want? Yeah, sweet. So now back to the um, the pH and the cancer cells. Tell us a little bit about more detailed overrun of the project and what you learned from that. Okay, so um, the overview of the whole um, research was to see how hemp extract or CBD, in other words, uh, how it impacts specifically ovarian cancer cells. Mm -hmm. uh, those are cancer cells that are, are not as much research as like brain, uh, brain or breast cancer cells. Right. It encouraged more awareness of those ovarian cancer cells because those uh, ovarian cells actually have links to other parts of your organs in your bodies that uh, makes it easy for the cancer to spread, especially once it enters stage four, where it, the cell, the cancer cell itself, knows that it's ready to move on. Yeah. Uh, so then, we focused on different treatments, both singular and mixed treatments of hemp extract and trying to create a cytotoxic level that would be enough for cancer cells to some, do some kind of change or damage to them, but obviously making sure that it doesn't go over the edge and start impacting healthy cells that are around your body or like in, or overall in your body. So um, the treatments we did, which with several background research, is mm -hmm. that we saw that hemp extract uh, impacts the pH level. pH level is basically if you've taken a high school or any college cl uh, science course, it's basically it's change of acidity or basis in an organism. Yeah. Uh, similar like why you always got to be careful with both things spreading on your skin is because mm -hmm. the interaction of hydrogen molecules right. they'll start connecting with your um, proteins that right. impact your body and it's where uh, the pH sort of changes. Right. That's that was basically what pH change means. So then, um, and, that, wait, and then lower pH, higher acidity, higher pH, lower acidity, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. So then uh, it's similar like how um, in like a comparison that always helps is like temperature wise. It's like you change the temperature of yourself both internally and externally. You, mm -hmm. you for sure will send some kind of change and you will need to adapt or change or do something to get you back to uh, 
to your regulatory temperature, right. which in cells, uh, the scientific name is homeostasis, which uh, if you haven't heard, it's basically just the balance of uh, o- o- organism both internally and externally mm-hmm. so that it can survive. So then we, with the hemp extract, manipulated that homeostasis of the cells, uh, both for the cell proliferation, which is uh, how quickly a cell um, grows mm-hmm. and uh, duplicates itself, then uh, as well as the migration, because like I mentioned before, once the cell ends to stage four, that's when it's for, uh, ready to migrate to other parts of your body mm-hmm. and it becomes more difficult to control it. The whole purpose of this um, experiment uh, research is that we wanted to find alternative to chemotherapy treatment. Because mm-hmm. um, if not every, if ever, not everyone is aware, um, chemotherapy t- uh, targets both cancer cells, but then also healthy cells in your body. Uh, that's why there's so many negative side effects from it as well. Yes, okay. and uh, why people suffer from nausea, vomiting, and things like that. So. While hemp extract doesn't eliminate the cancer cells, what it does do is uh, uh, put at least a break onto the cancer cell, both it's uh, the hallmark of them. Basically everything so from rapid growth to killing or infecting healthy cells to migration, uh, even manipulating the DNA of the healthy nucleus because... Um, the nucleus is what produces the DNA, which it, it's sort of like the code of the body telling what's going to happen, wh- right. like what's it going to become. So it, all, it puts a hold onto all of that, but obviously it doesn't cure it. So this is just like a first step into finding like a, a, a disabler or um, a, in our research, an inhibitor yeah. to the to, to the life of a cancer cell. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, when you um, intake when when you intake hemp or CBD in a treatment for these cancer cells, what what, what method would you use? So uh, we haven't uh, gone that far either okay. with the research. What we mostly did is how sort of like direct impact of the extract impacts the cell directly. In, like so, like injecting it into that specific area. Yes. Okay. So then the the. The end goal, the dream goal of this research would be to see uh, how it finally impacts humans if it gets consumed through orally, respiratorily, through injection, things like that. Mm-hmm. That's why we need to figure out, and that's the whole reason reason for this research, is to in- understand the level of toxicity that we can introduce to the human body, that it targets the cancer cells and without damaging the healthy cells in any way. Okay. Similar to like how chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy and CBD actually somewhat go hand in hand, where both of those treatments understand that they gotta go for a certain cell, which most of the time is like a quick growth or reproduction cell, uh-huh. similar to how blood cells are produced in your bones. Right. That's why chemotherapy targets like damages a lot of bone marrow and things like that. Cancer cells work on somewhat the same playing field where if it recognizes it's a cell that reproduces quickly, I'll target that. So we just gotta make sure that no, we don't go that far with CVD that it causes the same effect as chemotherapy. Right, wow, that's very, very revolutionary. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Um, now, I apologize if, if I overlook this, but I just, um, I'm very curious. What's the difference between how CBD and hemp affect cancer cells? Now, CBD and hemp are s- the same sense, the same thing. Okay. Uh, CBD just stands for uh, like cannabis oil, gotcha. which for that, it, it just means like it's more of like a chemistry term into the biological term, which the biological one is the cannabis uh, sativa plant which okay. is what was the specific marriage one plant that we extract all mm-hmm. of our active ingredients got you so you decide to use the sativa plant because that's where you get the active ingredients from hemp and cbd compared to indica yes yes so okay. uh from that one we actually get our what's called the full spectrum extract which contains a higher concentration of additional additional cannabinoids like the mm-hmm. cannabinoidic acid, which obviously being an acid, right. it manipulates the pH level of the cell. Okay, cool. Now, when you talk about the methods, the methods from hemp or CBD manipulates the pH and the acidity level of the cell. Is is this a unique way to treat cancer cells, or are there other similar treatments? 
that manipulate acidity um, of, um, a, of a cell? There are the um, ways of manipulating cancer cells. Uh-huh. Most of them involve using a synthetic product uh, grown in the lab and developed through them. This is more of a natural way where it, usually with a natural method, it doesn't impact or causes too great of a side effect on a human body. Right. Now, obviously, the downside of that is that it's not as potent as the stuff made in synthetic lab. That's mm-hmm. why like a lot of your vitamins and things like that in store buds are more effective than natural treatments because both they've been all uh, regulated by the FDA they know what's in them right and they actually reach to a point of manufacturing that it, it, yeah you take it it has benefits to your body if you take something natural that's not been regulated not been managed or anything like that you aren't guaranteed if it's gonna work or not right right but it is a little bit more holistic so yes. some people prefer those kind of treatments there's a, a large group of people who will forego chemotherapy and a lot of recommended medical treatments because they wish to treat their diseases more holistically. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, while I'm sharing all of this, don't take every, everything I take, uh, literally, uh, for me, even before just doing this research, I, um, honestly would have avoided chemotherapy just by the side effects that it mm-hmm. causes on the human body. Now, obviously, that scares me of how, if for whatever reason I do get cancer cells and things like that. I've I've done other holistic remedies that just it's sort of just to prevent cancer cells. Yeah. But if for whatever reason I were to diagnose with it, I I would try to avoid chemotherapy at all costs. But obviously, it, if it comes down to it, I might have to use it. But I so then doing this research, trying to understand its science and its backup and everything, it sort of gives me a better perspective and a more of a hopeful way of curing cancer without causing so much damage to your body that you wouldn't even recognize yourself. Honestly, yeah. You know, and I have thought about that before too. If I were to be, say, diagnosed with, say, stage four cancer or possibly even stage three, I'm not sure, depending on what kind it was, I think I might forego chemotherapy. This is my personal decision because I would rather spend the last few moments of my life where I'm somewhat healthy, can live and function rather than having to uh, suffer the whole way through. But that's that's my my personal take on that for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in like the more holistic side of medicine as well. That's why I'm really interested in public health. Because I like those uh, preventative practices. Um, I know you were talking about using some holistic preventions as well. Yes. Do you want to dive into that? Uh, yeah. Um, so when just talking to my professor, because we didn't do too much research into the other methods, it's just like resveratrol. It's a, a chemical compound that exists mostly in grapes and berries. What's they, it called again? Resveratrol. R e v e s t ra if i'm correct R-A. yeah now he only brought it up once or twice in uh-huh. the beginning of the um of our work together but it's mostly it's concentrated in like um red wine because they ex- uh, it's sort of like fermented through uh, grapes and wines and things like that that uh promotes a high concentration of that chemical compound in, yeah. in the glass of wine now obviously there's research that says like you gotta take like a whole two liters of it to actually make real any impact but just it's sort of like how most people microdose some of the treatments it's sort of i'm taking the same measure with red wine having Mm -hmm. at least a small bit of uh, glass each afternoon just to prevent it now there's no real scientific evidence that it does help prevent cancer but it's just like how anything in, in scientific research there's no real evidence until one conducts it or anything like that so um I'll still continue doing the same treatment that I'm doing just because it both is like the whole um, pos- positivity mentality that gives me of hopefulness that like uh, as long as I do this, I'm sure if I have a higher chance. It's it's all about chances and probabilities that you got to do that, that benefit you. And it's just both having a positive mindset about it, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And man, I love red wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A glass of that a night would, would, would do me good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For I'm, sure. I'm more of a white wine fan, but uh, mm. but it's not it's as effective as red. It's it's, it's sweeter. Yeah. yeah. D- you want to know something interesting? I read. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I the the article I read it is for sure a thing, and they gave wine connoisseur experienced wine connoisseurs, they gave them red wine that was disguised as white wine, and white wine that was disguised as red wine, 
and they described the taste of it unto which color it was. Oh. Yeah, and they said that that's a huge um, placebo of the mind. I I don't know, but that I remember reading that, and I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, more towards the the hemp and CBD and using that holistically, uh, are there any other um, positive health benefits that have been showed since there's been more research on them besides cancer treatments and such? Yes. Do you know any? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, so um, uh, all the treatments that CBD is being used for is for chronic diseases, any sort, and then especially nausea and vomiting that like are like byproducts of treatments afterwards mm-hmm. where uh, it's just sort of to numb the pain that you are experiencing throughout your body. Now, we didn't, were able to fully research that just because for our research, we just focus on the cells specifically, yeah. both healthy and uh, uh, cancerous epithelial cells. But uh, so then, because part of the whole reason for this research too is try to finalize it, I guess, to a point that now it can be used on human trials and things like that and actually start witnessing if there's some kind of change or hopefully a healthy change yeah. into the um, effects with uh, oh, cancer and things like that. But uh, so far, I mean, it's just mostly been uh, uh, sort of like word word on grapevine that is it is just helps numb pain and things like that yeah and then um some other uh research done is that is it helps re- sort of reset your mind more like uh, like adhd and things like that it sort mm-hmm. of helps them stabilize themselves more so but we obviously then uh, didn't look into it right 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 it's a completely completely separate field yeah but i know there was um there was a huge kind of stigma around it and then it started showing positive health benefits. I think that's eliminating the stigma, which is really, really good because, um, like in your work right there, it's being shown for very positive health treatments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, another thing that, um, that I talked to a, a colleague of mine uh, about the whole, uh, like the whole c- uh, fungus thing and starting like, um, trying to produce it and then sell it recreationally is the same issue that the, the hemp or CBD, um, has to deal with is, uh, Politically, in the past, it's been uh, it's been sort of like banned or like uh, been pushed towards like a war on drugs and kind of thing. Right. So then that that stigma is it's something that this sort of these treatments have to live with. That's why all of this research has to be conducted before we can even introduce it back to the people and try to find give them an alternative to chemotherapy right. and things like that. And man, it's frustrating because that stigma is a huge reason why work like this hasn't gone on earlier. And who knows if something like this were to come up, say maybe like twenty years ago, we may have a, a, a treatment by now. Right. But oh, because yeah. of that stigma, we're like, no, I'm not going to look into this. And you know, that's the same thing with psychedelics right now. There's yes. only, I don't know how many, but it's I can count them probably on one or two hands. The amount of labs in America that can legally conduct um, psychedelic trials. Oh yeah. And yeah. Who knows what, you know, who knows what we could learn from that. Right. Yeah, you and know? it's not even that. It's just like how t- you would want actually set up where like you can quantify those kind of psychedelic effects ethically without um, uh, like uh, pushing people's minds to like the wrong direction. Right. And then even like uh, just trying to legalize certain products here like where some states already opening it because it's just a slow introduction back to the people, but it's still going at a slow pace. Where like this this type of research could be more beneficial, but it just can't happen because of the whole stigma. Right. I, it just it doesn't make sense. It's like why are you afraid of of learning? Like I don't get it. Especially about a, that naturally grows out of the ground with with mushrooms and such. It's like this is this is a, a natural thing, and it's allowed to be here. You just can't you just can't touch it. And you can't you can't look into it. You just need to leave it alone. Right. Like that just doesn't make sense to me. It's like if it's naturally here, why aren't we being encouraged to study it and figure out what it has to offer? I mean, that's what the whole point of, of research is, is 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 opening those doors, looking behind those curtains and then figuring out more about the world because you never know what's going to come out of it. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always been a shame like that. But that, that's that's why people like us we do research and right. things like that just true start like at least not opening a door but at least like letting a window open and p- let, let people see in and what's actually happening and things like that yeah that's why we also like try to present it to conference and things like that because a lot of people like not even non-science uh, people attend those conference and are more curious about these kind of um these kind of works yeah 
And I, I think a good bit of the scientific community has kind of opened their minds up to it. But, um, yeah, the idea of having those non-scientific people attend these kind of conferences does a good job at uh, reducing stigma around those types of things. Yes. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think I asked you, what was your major? Uh, my major is organismal biology. Organismal biology. Yes. Sweet. I, I got two minors that I already completed, geology okay. and geography. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very cool. What do you, um, what do you plan on doing in the future? <laughs> that's always a <laughs> that's a tough question because yeah. uh, so my background uh, I'm trilingual. I really what do you speak? Uh, Spanish, German, and English. Cool. So I'm half Colombian, half German. Yeah. So and then with that I've traveled uh, um, like two, three, three different continents, lived in them, really? and everything. So yeah, that kind of experience um, I sort of am now used to. Uh -huh. I've actually lived here in Ohio for 13 years, and it's a little. uncomfortable. I want to say uncomfortable, so I'm op I'm ready to keep moving. But uh, well, why 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 uncomfortable? I don't know. I feel like early on, we I always felt like me and my family were nomads, just going from one place to another. So mm -hmm. then now it's settling, being in the same house 13 years. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I, I honestly miss traveling. That's why I tend to do a lot of study abroad. Yeah. But um, now since I'm I'm about to graduate at the end of this this uh this year, I I've made several plans because I always like to plan ahead. Even right. though even though it's not gonna happen 100 i do leave room for deviation right so um i want to say my plan a might just stay here obviously i try to move out but depending how current things are i might start uh, my master's program mm -hmm. the following year if not i will probably take a year uh, not travel but i try to find another place where i settle down something small and things like that yeah. um then try to continue on either some kind of biological realm. I would rather do like a master's program in mycology, study of fungus and things like right. that, but there's no real program. So it, I, so I'm sort of open to anything that would get me close to it, either like agricultural, plant pathology, mm -hmm. uh, entomology, anything where like fungal growth can be uh, used industrially and beneficial and alternative to rather, rather, rather using chemical or pesticides and things like that. Right. Plus where research would be um, encouraged to find alternative, more natural, biological ways. Yeah. Um, that might be another plan. And then that with that one, it can include either being in the States or out of States doing an international study. Just because, I mean, I got the language. I figure I might as well use it. Right. So um, no, that's a so huge yeah. talent to have. That's a huge skill to have. That's very impressive. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, thanks. I, I'm very surprised that there's not a specific graduate degree for mycology. And if not, there's, I'd hope that they would start something like that soon. Yeah, no, um, it's pretty tough always to start a new program like that. Uh, if you do find one, it's pretty rare. Right. Because um, uh, I want to say a lot of the mycologists that are out in the field is mostly because they sort of are self proclaimed Right. Because just through 10, 15, 20 years of experience, they already know everything about the fungus. And it's sort of those people that are, uh, like have a huge passion about fungus and mushroom things like that it's similar to me so that's why um, just now I'm doing the research obviously it's not as not as huge as like scientists people with PhDs and things like that right. but like, this will at least get me started into like a larger uh, term Th there's this one guy I don't I don't know if you know his name um, but he actually he doesn't have a PhD and like white hair round glasses okay and a hat. let me look him up because I think you'd really be interested in him oh I th I want to say I think I know him, but I, I can't remember his name. I know I've talked to at least one staff faculty uh, here on the Kent campus. I think he teaches mostly digital media. Okay. But he went with us to our most recent study abroad over this winter break. And yeah, he, he, he's done... He studied fungus for 20 years. Now, he doesn't actually do like the whole research and things like that, the scientific uh, methods and things like that. But like he, he's gone out, gone foraging and things like that for mushrooms and things like that. And, and it's actually with him that I'm going to be trying to see if I can do an internship. Paul Stamets. I've, I know the Stamets. name. Stamets. Yeah. This guy right here. I don't know what his educational background is. I American mycologist and entrepreneur who sells mushroom products through he as a company and is an author and advocate of medical fungi and micromediation. Mm. I'm not sure. I I looked him up years ago once, but then uh, 
but yeah, nowadays for like the research that I do, um, most of the time I don't look at the authors and things like that. I just look at the research itself and see what can be done. That's some. That's something I might have to in the future, especially once I start doing master's program, because the reason that if I do it, uh, if I st- if plan A works out, I might do my master's program here at Kent State. Yeah. But I still would follow like sort of like um, fungus or mycology related work. That plan doesn't work out, then I would have to probably either look for universities or professors that are uh, experts in that kind of field and start uh, asking for them and their university, seeing if they have a master program, if they're willing to take me and yeah. things like that. Are they so. def- I think they definitely would be. Yeah. I know if I was running the program, I would take you. Yeah. Here is, so he has a bachelor's degree. Okay. Um, he grew up in Ohio. We're happy to claim him. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he has a bachelor's degree. And this is something interesting. He was awarded an honorary doctorate by national U- by um, the National University of Medicine. Oh. Uh, which is a, a naturopathic med- uh, medical school. Okay. Um, something very interesting. And I was kind of looking into this. So th- from this is from what I understand. There's three different types of uh, like medical training. Uh, you, you have your MDs, medical doctors, with most traditional uh, DOs, which is osteopathic doctor. Uh, they're a little bit more holistic, and they're trained on, I think it's over 200 hours of osteopathic manipulation. And they treat problems a little bit more holistic on, like, the whole idea of the body. And they try and find the root cause of the problem, not just, you know, treating specific disease. But then there's also something called an ND which is a naturopathic doctor. Um, and that's the, that's the type of school that awarded him an honorary doctorate. Wait, honorary doctorate is in, he didn't actually go to school for the doctorate, but since he's contributed so much to the field of mycology, they give him an honorary doctorate just for the reward for his contributions. And he obviously deserves it. But naturopathic medicines, it's, it's more treating with natural elements and plants and stuff like that. So they're the most holistic practice. Oh. But they're not, you know, it's unfortunate because they're not, they're not recognized as much. Right. Okay. Yeah, because I was going to say, like, that might be a little conflicting because part of, like, this research is sort of trying to find that natural or introducing a holistic way into, like, the scientific field and things mm-hmm. like that. So. I think we need a lot more of that, honestly. Yeah. And there's a lot more people that prefer that. And there's some people that who, who turn down traditional treatments because they need that. They believe in that holistic treatment. I, I'm very surprised they don't have a mycology degree because if you think about it, the, where there's three different kingdoms, right? Mm-hmm. The plants, animals, and, fungi. and then fungi. Yeah. A lot of people don't know fungi is its own kingdom. And it's the most fascinating. And it's the one I think that needs the most looking into, I would say. Yeah, but like I mean, even that change into its own kingdom has mm-hmm. only happened in like the last century. Okay, yeah. so it's probably going to catch up then, because you know they have they have botany and like you mentioned plant pathology, and they have organismal biology, like which is your major. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's it's t- I think it would be time for them to focus on a certain fungal concentration. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I hope so too. Um, I've so, I've I've talked to a few professors that try to encourage me that I have no idea how to go about it, but especially uh, like uh, in an international level, like setting up somewhere like a school program yeah. or like a growth facility to grow my own cordyceps and things like that, just to introduce it to like states and things. But uh, I, like I said, I wouldn't know how to go about it. Yeah, it fun like interesting thing is that uh, it took me quite a while to find like an actual um, textbook about fungi really? and mycology and that like that. Yeah, I found one, but like the the one I got is a second edition. The previous edition was done in 2010, okay. which was way before they actually started having the whole genetics yeah. aspect to it, which uh, it actually works now more closely with fungi because it being such a small organismal thing is that it, there's no real way of like uh, physically categorizing them on like a specific level so like that's why genetics is gets introduced to it it's like, even nowadays with a lot of like uh, animals and plants tax taxonomy wise mm-hmm. they'll start re- rearranging the tree of life so then the fungi actually benefits a lot from that so that way now we know which exact fungi we're working and what like all the small details that i work with it yeah interesting um are you able to dive more into detail about how uh, genetics relates with fungi? 
just reading that myself. Yeah. Um, so then the research I've done both with the cordyceps and then Osimo with the honeybees will have other people co- have co-authors yeah. with, our, with our work that will m- have more uh, genetic background or an expertise in that field. I With the uh, textbook I just recently bought, I, I haven't touched bases on that yet, but I hopefully eventually will. And then I'm sure that's something I'll see uh, more frequently in the future once I dive more into a, uh, specializing into fungi and how they work. Interesting, so. yeah. No, that's something I'm going to look a lot more into because... As of now, my current ga- graduate plan is biostatistics okay. and then a huge st- study with that, uh, genetics. Because okay. you're managing that, that large just genetic data. And I would be interested in studying fungus through that. So yeah. I think that'd be very, I think yeah. that'd be very interesting. Yeah, for me, it's probably going to be backwards. It's going to be studying fungi and then into biostatistics True, and yeah. bioinformatics. <laughs> there's a lot, I'm sure there, there's, there's, there's a lot to learn that I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. There always yeah. is. But yeah, that's why we have uh, colleagues and friends to help us along because uh, it's going to be impossible to know everything for one single person. And yeah. Not as real beneficial as like spreading spreading the word around. Mm-hmm. So. I know even um, that was one of my hardest things in, in uh, when I was in one of my biology courses is we had to uh, draw and memorize the the life cycle of certain fungi and like with the spores the, sp- the sporophytes the sporangias mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff the reproduction cycle of the fungus right. and everything like that and we had to like draw out the little things that was hard for me yeah. that was really hard for me because so, it's so new they, you know they work so much different than a lot of things oh yeah yeah it's, like um, in the past people thought it was plants and like since they like you can really distinguish a fungus or especially mycelium from actual tree roots and plant roots you wouldn't yeah. even know the difference but now now they're more categorized more like, leaning towards animals rather than plants so um but like yeah, that's the, weird that's yeah. so weird yeah but like um they function their, their functions are similar to that of an animal so but like not yet the same so that's why they get their own kingdom and everything right but, but yeah it's it was, it was quite fascinating just learning about them mm-hmm. and yeah another thing people don't realize is the the, the mycelium itself is the actual organism right uh, yeah i want to say like f- like physically it is yeah yeah so like the actual organism is underground Oh, yes. And then the mushrooms are the fruit. Yeah, or yeah. like it's a way of disturb, uh, like distributing itself. Right. And they can be huge. Like one fungal organism. Uh, do you know the exact size of the biggest fungal organism? I saw an image of it, but I couldn't figure out where exactly it was. I think it was like uh, round table size, if I can remember. But no, I think it was bigger. Well, it was, yeah, the si- it was the size, yeah. Yeah, but, but like I, the, the fruit size, and uh, from what I know, is that the actual organism, the biggest one, is um, is right underneath the Appalachian uh, mountain regions in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. and things like that. Because like with all the mycelium that connect to one another with each tree, that's basically. Uh, its entire system. Yeah. So then that's actually like the largest one. I, I don't know really the food one. There's one in um, Oregon I found. Um, this is on discovery.com. Yes. Malheur National Forest. Um, it said uh, it is 3.5 square miles. Oh, wow. Worth of it says fungus, but I'm assuming it's referring to the mycelium underground. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, the Fruit part, like, uh, like, just thinking about it, logically, it wouldn't make sense to have it so huge because um, the spores are so tiny. Right. Like, you don't even see them or anything. So It'd be like big asteroids coming out of something that yeah. big. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's un- uh, what is it? Uh, unbeneficial for it. Right. It makes sense. Man, that it's fascinating. It is. Fascinating, yeah. for sure. So now that we talked about the project, what do you, what would you say you've learned the most from the research process? What has research taught you the most? Oh, uh, especially all the the practices, the methods that has to go into all this research, especially with this one with the ovarian cancer cells, because it involves a different aspect of more of like a cellular. Uh, method and approach to go about it because um, with other projects we've done just more like a uh, I don't know what to, uh, how to put it but it'll be more like a larger scale not neither micro nor macro but like uh, just hands-on mm-hmm. more uh, more dissecting just using a like a uh, microscope 
where with the cell, uh, ovarian cancer cells, we have to literally dive into the micron world, into it, seeing its nucleus on a microscope, which you can't do it on a standard one. You need to, for what we used here was a fluorescent one that we even had to introduce a dye that would attach to certain parts of the cell, yeah. illuminate them, and then we can determine what we're actually seeing. And depending if there's more dye or less dye, how that actually correlates with the response of the cell. So this is just like it's a different um different world of research that had to be um taught with all of this process but i'm for sure that we'll be able to use the same one if for if for whatever reason i decided to go in like the whole um medical field with fungus and things like that i already would have some uh head start versus uh most students is, uh, i and oh, for universities sure. for sure yeah if you had one if you had one more thing to share with the world what would it be uh do not hesitate. Do not hesitate. Yeah. Sure, it's scary, but that doesn't mean you have to stand still. If you want something or it interests you, go for it. Yeah. Because yeah, hesitate will uh, being hesitant will be your biggest consequence. Jump when when it's scary. Jump. Yep. Well, Martin, it's been awesome having you on the show. You know, you're welcome back anytime, especially over the summer. I'm going to have you on to keep updated with your project and everything. Really, just shoot me a text and I'll get you in the studio. Again, this is your host John of the Research Review creating a platform to inspire. Peace out.